Joining me now is Rihanna Gunright. She's the policy lead for the Green New Deal at New Consensus, which is kind of a super cool thing to be. There's a, a new think tank called New Consensus, and it is put together by Zach Exley. In that Mr. Reagan video, there was four masterminds that were mentioned as behind AOC. Um, they forgot to mention AOC as <laughs> one of the masterminds, which was, of course, the whole point of that conservative um, conspiracy theory attack, uh, that she was an actress, which is hilarious. Um, she's more prepared than any congressperson I have ever seen. And uh, and I'm not just saying that because that I support her ideologically. Uh, it's absolutely true. But anyway, one of the uh, one of the masterminds was theoretically me, uh, hilarious. And uh, another one was Zach Exley, and he is also doing new consensus. These are actually just good progressives who worked on these issues, okay, and worked on these campaigns. All right, now back to Rihanna. Uh, Rihanna, welcome to the Young Turks. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. All right, great. Uh, there we go. Now, Rihanna, I build you as the mastermind uh, behind the Green New Deal. <laughs> so uh, soon there will be YouTube nothing. videos about you. So I'm warning you now. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what are you guys uh, doing in reality uh, to come up with a policy behind the Green New Deal? So New Consensus has three objectives when it comes to policy development for the Green New Deal. Uh, we identify, align, and mobilize expertise. And so that means for us a few things. The first is just an intervention in how we define expertise. So New Consensus defines expertise not just as academics or policy wonks, but folks in frontline communities who have been working on these issues for years. And we bring those people to the same table sometimes in physical convening sometimes in other ways to talk through these issues. And so we've begun that process. We continue to identify experts, particularly from frontline communities, and bring them in. And so right now we're actually designing a policy input process uh, where there'll be an internal Likely, we'll see what shape this is, but there will be uh, an input side for frontline communities, so for actual residents, and then also input from experts uh, across the board, largely working together. And so right now, we've just been identifying experts and then bringing them in to talk about what are the questions that we need to be considering in each of the areas of the new the Green New Deal. What are the tensions, and so what are and what are the solutions? Just beginning to talk about solutions um, that fit these criteria, along with the goals and the Green New Deal. So, before we even get into the details of uh, the Green New Deal itself, um, I, I love <laughs> the way that New Consensus is thinking about organizing a new way of doing think tanks. Uh, so, yeah. uh, for almost all of the think tanks. All they care about is the elites. They're staffed by the elites, they're for the elites. Uh, I don't know that they ever talk to any real Americans. And so when you talk about uh, bringing in real Americans from the front lines, uh, it's, a, it's a great idea and a constituency that ironically in a democracy is never served. Uh, and so, <laughs> yeah. and, and look, Rihanna, <laughs> this is a kind of funny thing. I'm gonna throw a lot of uh, uh, weird compliments at you, but. Um, Arguably, you're part of the elites because uh, you're a Rhodes Scholar, yeah. uh, and yeah. you know you're a policy director for Abdul El Said. Uh, you're a policy analyst for the Detroit Health Department. You're a policy intern for Michelle Obama. So you have a tremendous amount of qualifications uh, to wrestle with this topic. Yeah. But I love that you are then going and talking to people uh, because qualifications aren't just being a Rhodes Scholar, aren't just being an expert on the topic, but living. Uh, the the issues, the problems, etc., that we're confronted with in the Green New Deal. Unfortunately, every day you have more victims to talk to. Uh, you know, right? Uh, including the yeah. flooding in in the Midwest now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so my interest uh, and New Consensus's interest more broadly comes from several people, but my interest comes from the fact that, like, yes, I am an elite now, but I grew up in Inglewood in Chicago, um, and that 
the just the circumstance of my life being born there, having a single mother, even though my mom had a college degree, I had to leave home at 14 to go to a good high school. Um, and so recognizing where I come from and the folks who are still there and the ways that they need to be served have always motivated me. I've always been writing for my home. Um, and I know that that's true for other folks at New Consensus. But beyond my personal um, feelings or experience, it just makes good policy. Uh, so much policy fails because one, uh, because it's made by elites who don't actually often use the systems that they're uh, making policies about, especially when it comes to social policy, um, they're de often designing for problems that people are not defining as the problems that they want solved. And so that creates a lot of tension. And also, um, everything is embedded in a system. So when you change a policy, other parts of the system also change. And so you can create a lot of unintended uh, negative second order effects. And so talking to folks on the ground, they are the people who can identify those second order effects the most quickly and the most efficiently. And so instead of designing things and then bringing it to them, right, which means that you've already decided the power relationships that you want, you've probably already made relationships based on what's in there. Um, and so things aren't quite as movable as you're presenting. If you take that to people and just ask them to give feedback, you're not getting yourself the chance to make the best policy. Um, so that's also where new consensus is coming from, especially for something with a Green New Deal. We just don't have time to be not considering second in order effects, not considering what's happening in local communities, not treating those as real interventions, and not recognizing that for better or worse, a lot of states and localities have been trying to figure out how to solve this problem on their own and have things uh, that can be scaled up and at the very least lessons that can be learned. So Rihanna, now let's get into the heart of uh, what could be in the Green New Deal. Because right now, what they yeah. voted on was a, a non-binding resolution. And they right. kind of voted on it. I, I, I don't know what your <laughs> yes. political thoughts on it are, but I, I hated that uh, voting present by the Democrats. Um, <laughs> okay, but that's a separate conversation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, And I'm also probably not the best person for that conversation. I stay pretty closely focused on the policy aspects yeah, of it. Yeah, I hear you. So let's stick with that. So uh, of course, the right wing think tanks are, well, how shall I phrase this? Liars. Uh, so one of them came up with this outrageous, preposterous lie that the Green New Deal would cost ninety-three trillion dollars, and 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 eighty billion of that had nothing to do with the environment. I mean, not eighty billion, eighty trillion of it had nothing to do with the environment. It's the whole thing's. It's been debunked in every way that you can debunk something. Uh, but that does lead to the question of well, they they were making up numbers because there isn't any actual policy right. initiatives yet in the non-binding resolution. What could be in the legislation that would actually be the Green New Deal? Well, I mean, the project set, or the resolution sets out 14 projects, which will all be policies in various forms. Some are bigger programs, which are upgrade, say upgrading every home and building in the US to be more energy efficient, um, as well as safer. Um, and that is a project that would take multiple policies. There's other things um, like a smart grid, which is will take multiple policies, but is often seen as like a discrete um, policy. And so you will definitely see um, a movement towards a smart grid, sort of what would policies to create a smart grid. Um, you're definitely going to see policies to decarbonize uh, the electricity sector. Right now, the resolution is purposely technology neutral so that everything's on the table and we have all everything um, available to make smart decisions. But you could definitely see um, different elements about decarbonizing um, electricity, including right investments in distributed um, um, distributed renewables, distributed solar, um, efforts to make our energy system more efficient, some really 
interesting thoughts about energy governance, right? Um, you're also going to see in various aspects, right? Uh, transportation, obviously, that is going to involve policies around the adoption of EVs and the deployment of EVs, as well as investments in public transit. And of course, there's a whole infrastructure piece, which is all about how do we actually uh, create sustainable infrastructure um, for the 21st century. So of course, you're going to see a lot of public investment um, there. And also, investment in sort of the next generation of American infrastructure. So how do you think about infrastructure outside of building um, highways, right? How do you think about it outside of roads? Um, and what sort of investments do we need um, to, to have to reduce energy use? So you're going to be seeing some things around uh, land use um, and the ways that infrastructure supports, um, supports that and supports the movement to more on energy efficient communities. So some those are some of the things that you'll see. It's really difficult to say specifics because we are serious about consultation. We are serious about not making choices before we talk to people, which is very disconcerting for a lot of folks, but we mean it. And so that's why there's hesitancy, but the resolution gives out uh, gives some really good ideas about the goals and some of the policies that would fit underneath that. So, Rihanna, there's a lot to talk about there, uh, but let's talk about transportation for a second. Uh, yeah. The Republicans keep saying that you guys are going to ban airplanes. <laughs> so, can we dispense with that? Uh, are airplanes <laughs> going to uh, remain legal, uh, even though we would like people to use them less? Yeah, uh, I, I have not heard any serious conversations about making airplanes illegal, at least on our side. But there is a real question of how do you make um, airplanes emissions free, right? Aviation is a very difficult sector uh, to decarbonize. And so you will see thinking in there about electrification, which isn't, which has a really disputed and largely uh, a lot of folks don't think about that in terms of aviation. But of course, then you're talking about biofuels. There's a lot of issues with biofuels, but it's also a promising way forward. So how do we make biofuels cleaner, um, right? Um, how do we how do we offset emissions from aviation too, right? Especially as we know that the technology to decarbonize aviation is starting to be commercialized and is in its infancy and how do we grow those markets? Um, but that's so that's what we're thinking about in terms of innovation or in terms of aviation, yeah. not banning, but how do you do it responsibly and how do you do it in the framework of a more sustainable economy? Yeah, what I love is that, you know, the mainstream media equates Republicans and Democrats and it's hilarious because their side is like, oh, they're gonna ban airplanes, man. And on our side, we have a Rhodes Scholar talking about offsetting emissions to decarbonize aviation. Okay, <laughs> gee, I wonder who's the yeah. smart party. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So one last thing here because we're running out of time, Rihanna. Uh, sure. And how much time do you think it's going to take to be able to come up with the actual legislation? Uh, is it a process that you think will take six months, a year, 18 months? And I know you're guessing at it, but to the best right. of your ability to guess. Well, one of the reasons that the Green New Deal is framed off of the New Deal was that the New Deal was a, a rash of legislation over a long time period. And we expect that the Green New Deal will also take a similar form. So some folks are interested. We already know that some folks are interested in releasing something within the next six months to um, to a year, but really the next six months. Um, and so that will be on particular pieces of the Green New Deal. So what I think you'll see and, and why the timeline question is difficult is that you'll probably see different legislators breaking out different parts of the Green New Deal and releasing plans about that uh, or re releasing legislation about that. And so I think it depends. I think you'll see some within the next six months um, to 10 months, especially from presidential candidates. We already know that some of them are working on their own versions of the Green New Deal. So you'll see that. And of course, some of that will likely be turned into legislation. You'll probably see the the biggest bulk of Green New Deal legislation come after the 2020 election. Um, when hopefully we have a Democrat in office who is excited and willing to work on these issues. Um, but you'll definitely see some things moving um, in a piecemeal fashion before then, for sure. Okay, so you say you don't do politics, you do policy. So 
Uh, uh, future cabinet secretary, Rihanna Gunn Wright, thank you for joining us on The Young Turks. <laughs> really appreciate it. it was lovely, thank you for having me. Uh, no problem, uh, all right, everybody check out New Consensus and, and get involved, thank you.